No one's even gonna watch this, but here we go. Here we go. I did a poll on my Instagram and asked if you guys would rather that I do my review of The Last Black Man in San Francisco as a live or as a normal edited video, like such as this. And edited video was the choice that won, so this is for all four of you who will actually follow through on that poll and watch this. Let's talk about The Last Black Man in San Francisco. This is going to lean more toward being a discussion rather than a traditional review because there's a lot of ideas and things that I wanna unpack in here that will be difficult to discuss without actually giving away certain details. So I will do my best not to be too spoilerlicious on you guys, but just beware um, if I do feel like something spoilerlicious is coming up, I will do my best to give you guys a warning. The Last Black Man in San Francisco. I went into this movie pretty much blind, as is my preference. One of my greatest joys since leaving the movie channel that I used to work for here on YouTube is no longer having to scrutinize every leaked photo or poster or teaser or trailer that comes out, all to try to glean every scrap of information about a movie we can before its release in an attempt to uh, turn it into content and I guess take all joy out of actually watching the movie. So I'd read I think a one to three sentence synopsis a good three weeks before I actually saw the movie and that was it. In fact the only two words that I could remember from the synopsis that I had read by the time I actually got around to seeing the film were the words Danny Glover which while not necessarily a draw when paired with the actual title of the film were enough to get my foot in the door. My interest was piqued and I had actually made plans to hang out with my girl, Michelle Ganagata. Some of you guys may have seen the video I did, which is not a vlog. I'll link that here in case you were curious. We went to see the movie together and she was a great sport, definitely a true enabler of my movie dude. So yeah, she was really cool about indulging me in seeing the weird types of movies that I like to see and this one is no exception. This movie is weird. It's very strange. Off the cuff, it was extremely evocative of Wes Anderson, but with black people which is strange because you don't really see black people in Wes Anderson movies. Unless the fact that the character is black is somehow a plot device. So I guess the fact that Danny Glover is in this and he's also worked with Wes Anderson, it's kind of a noteworthy uh, coincidence. But very similarly to Wes Anderson movies, in this film, the characters often uh, have uniforms of sorts. Also evocative of Wes Anderson is just the use of the environments in this film, how the environments themselves are characters within the film just as much as the actual speaking characters. The music cues, the notion of a performance within a performance because there's a play within the film with homemade props and costumes and so forth, all very DIY, all very Wes Anderson. I don't want to keep harping on the similarities to Wes Anderson because by no means does Wes Anderson own any of these motifs or themes, but the collection of them in one work is indisputably very reminiscent and evocative of Wes Anderson's oeuvre. And the opening sequences of this film definitely took me back to my youth in a way where I wasn't really sure, I was getting my bearings, I guess. I was very much like swept up in the world of this film right away, where I felt like I was seeing things that were new and fresh and creative and different. From the very beginning of this film, from the very first frame, from the very first sequence, it gave me that feeling that reminded me of why I wanted to go to film school in the first place and look into storytelling as my career. Although I'm not sure writing dick jokes counts as storytelling. So the visual motifs that we are given from the very top of the film are just, we see two men sharing one skateboard and to travel a long distance at that. We see the scorn of onlookers from the street as they arrive in San Francisco. And even though it feels like this is a not too distant dystopian future, they make it very clear from early on in the film that this is the present, it's 2019. But the idea of the reaction being, what the f are those n doing here when two black men arrive in San Francisco is not far-fetched or more accurately, it's not far off. There's even a moment in that early journey sequence getting into San Francisco where there's one white man who sees them and he actually starts chasing them down the street, stripping off his clothes, yelling that he wants to join them as if by virtue of simply being in San Francisco and being black men in San Francisco, they're somehow starting a revolution. We even see food being thrown at them, which is a direct throwback, no pun intended, 
to vaudeville, where back then there wasn't any such thing as covert racism. It was all overt, and I think that that was a clear choice by the filmmakers. They really explored the notion of towing instances of overt racism in the face of people who really want to be tolerant or accepting, or better said, those who want to appear to be tolerant, those who fancy themselves to be the woke white person. There's even a moment where someone throws a croissant at Jim, who's the protagonist, and it's just like, of all the foods to pick, and the croissant gets thrown at him because he's fixing up the exterior of a house and trespassing on someone's property. He's painting, and the, the homeowner throws a croissant at him. Ultimately, we learn that Jim is fixing up this house because his family used to live there. It used to be their house, and he and his friend Mont, who is on the spectrum for sure, they basically go into San Francisco, and they try to sneak in and fix up the house whenever the homeowners aren't there because they really allowed it to fall into disrepair and not be the glorious home that it once was because Jim eventually hopes to be able to move back into his family home and call it his own again. We do know that Jim and Mont are friends, but their relationship is honestly never fully defined. Homophobia is definitely insinuated once or twice from some other people in the neighborhood where they live, but the overarching theme here honestly is simply the importance of friendship. I think it's a bold statement by the filmmakers that it doesn't really matter what the exact relationship is between these two. We see and hear what we need to know as it is pertinent to drive the story. And then it forces you as a viewer to confront, well, why do I need to get such a clear label to have this friendship defined so clearly? Like, it, it actually doesn't matter. And that's true about a lot of things in this movie. Many things are never fully explained, and that includes both backstories and current stories. I really love love that this film makes a point to eschew binary thinking, which I think a lot of you guys are catching on that that is basically my life's work. It is human nature to try to categorize everything into either being this or being that. But this movie confronts that tendency in ways that are both blatant and subtle. This or that. One of my favorite moments is when Mont is talking to Jim and um, they're talking about the neighborhood bullies who have flung some homophobic accusations at them and among other just teasing and taunting. And Mont says something along the lines of, what, just because they're mean to me, I can't be interested in them? That's silly. I found that these filmmakers had really extraordinary restraint in their exposition here. You're forced to form your own conclusions many times throughout the story. And audiences generally aren't used to being challenged this way. Take it from Marvel, they generally respond poorly to anything that's even remotely obtuse. The overarching theme of this flick for me anyway is just the importance of belief. Of believing what could have been, of believing what could be. Because for those of us who are really sensitive souls, the absence of optimism is a death sentence. Another huge theme is the importance of external belief on one's internal belief. And this might be slightly spoilerlicious, so feel free to click off or fast forward. But even having one person who believes in you, and in this case, not only believes in you, but believes you, can inspire such an important shift of belief in self. You know, it's the audacity of hope and sometimes someone has to be audacious enough to believe in you first. It might not be apparent, for many of us, it isn't. Friends matter, friendship isn't frivolous, and friendships can be as or more important than romantic relationships. Self-esteem doesn't exist in a vacuum. Someone has to gas you up first and get you to a point where you can take that belief that they have in you and then find that belief in yourself. In addition, this movie is beautifully shot. It really is a love letter in many ways to San Francisco, but it's also a hate letter. Again, spoilerlicious commentary on the way, so I hope that you have clicked off or if you fast forwarded, fast forward again. But it shows just how devastating gentrification can be and how it doesn't have to look the way we tend to see it look. And unfortunately, because of these systems of gentrification in place that we're seeing in so many different cities, most notably San Francisco, San Francisco is definitely one of the worst. Jimmy's lie may as well have been true. Even if his grandfather really had built that house, if it really had been their family home, he would have been in the same exact predicament. It didn't matter that that wasn't the truth. I think the point is that it wouldn't have mattered if it was or wasn't true. Couple things before I wrap this up. Um, I do want to mention the pacing of this film. Let me just say, 
the Instagram generation wasn't built for this. However, that is our fault. And I don't think that storytellers and filmmakers should have to cater to our extremely short attention spans. Indeed, it's a very unique and special experience to find yourself adjusting to something with slower pacing, to reveling in the quiet moments of the film and being with your own thoughts, and even letting our minds wander for a minute or two while we continue to ruminate on ideas or events that just were presented in the scene previous. Last up, I do think it's worth mentioning that the director of this film is white, which is a bit, uh, bit ironic for a movie called The Last Black Man in San Francisco, but this dude evidently did co-write the film with Jimmy Fails, who is the co-writer and star of this film, so I guess he is uh, playing himself. I didn't notice in the credits if Antoine Fisher was listed as a producer though. Anyway, those are my thoughts on The Last Black Man in San Francisco. If you were curious, I do recommend it highly. Just be prepared for that slow pacing. It is a very slow, thoughtful, takes its time, really kind of digs into moments between characters and just with, with the city of San Francisco itself. It really is lovely to look at. And just so many uh, ideas, social issues being presented really 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 recommend highly definitely worth a watch and if you're really like a level 10 movie like I am you should also check out the Toni Morrison documentary which was released maybe two months ago it's called the pieces that I am I also saw that and I didn't review it because I don't even think the four of you watching this would have watched the review on that but that is easily one of the most inspiring pieces that I've watched in a very long time and it actually has me fired up to read or reread a lot of her m biggest works because I Song of Solomon remains one of the best and most important books I've ever read but there's some other books of hers that I have read including The Bluest Eye which was her first one so I'm gonna start there and probably work my way through her body of work. Anyway thanks to all four of you who not only watch this video but if you're hearing me right now you watched it all the way to the end so I see you and I appreciate you. I did also review The Lion King just before this so I will link that on the end screen that immediately follows this if you would like to check it out but beyond that that's gonna do her. Thanks again for hanging out with me and remember Never trust anyone with a Morphe code. Bye-bye. That's a, that's a nappy-headed hose there, I'm going to tell you that now. <laughs>